Okay, out of uh, deference to our guests who are visiting us from Israel in the middle of the night, I'd like to begin the call. This is Alan Jay. I'm the Acting National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at ZOA. Welcome to our latest installment of Zoom with ZOA, our virtual programming um, uh, mode. Your microphone should remain muted for the duration of the call. There is a chat feature in the Zoom bottom of the uh, window. You can put questions in the chat box if you so desire. We will also allow for you to raise hands at the end of the program <clears throat> if you have questions. But the better choice is to put your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many uh, questions as we can. The name of today's program is Dispelling Lies and Myths Coming from Israel. Our guest speakers are Doug Altebeth, board chair at Imtir Tzu, and Matan Peleg, CEO at the same organization in Israel, Imtir Tzu. Today, ZOA has hosted many uh, webinars. We've hosted ambassadors, members of Congress, senior ZOA personnel, famous authors, and members of the press. We've hosted many guests from Israel, Amon Seal from Tatspeet, Zev Orenstein from Ir David, and venture capitalist Jonathan Medved, to name a few. And there's much, much more programming to come. The Zionist organization was founded in 1897, and since then, we've been advocating for Israel right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria, with Jerusalem as our undivided capital, and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. We do this through several divisions. We have our Center for Law and Justice with, under the direction of Susan Tuckman. We're using the law to fight anti-Semitism and advocate for the rights and safety of the Jewish people, especially on college campuses. Our Department of Government Relations, which is directed by Dan Pollock, making sure that all members of Congress know the truth about all issues relating to Israel and the Middle East. Our ZOA campus department is extremely strong. We're on 100 campuses plus. We have 40 paid ZOA fellows that all deliver our pro-Zionist message. They work very closely, as I said, with our Center for Law and Justice, making sure that the rights of all students are protected. We have regional offices around the country to represent ZOA's interests, pro-Israel, and defending uh, the rights of Jews all over. And ZOA's greatest asset may very well be our national president, Mort Klein, one of the most preeminent respected figures in, Israel and Jewish in the Israel and Jewish adv advocacy space, who often appears in the media and who has been asked to testify before Congress on behalf of all of our causes, many of our causes. Attacks on Israel and the Jewish people have only increased during these strange and tumultuous times, and ZOA's workload unfortunately grows. So as you're listening to today's program, please consider supporting our ZOA for the first time or increasing your gift if you're already a supporter. <clears throat> I'm extremely excited about tonight's program, Dispelling Lies and Myths Coming from Israel, with our guest speakers. Our guest speakers first visited ZOA last summer <clears throat> to explore synergies between our two organizations. All I knew at the time was that Imtir Tzu posted on their website, and that was that Imtir Tzu is a nonprofit organization working to strengthen the values of Zionism in Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. And they listed that their mission concerning Zionism and its values has always been dual pronged to advance the good and to confront the bad. So I figured it was a good, uh, a good synergy for us to explore. Now, I have family in Israel since 1963. Uh, all of my family has served in the IDF, some in combat units, some in intelligence, some in wartime. And all of them, every one of them, love Israel and promote Israel so much that they could actually be fe featured in promotional spots. As a matter of fact, all Israelis that I know love Israel and promote the, the values that Israel represents. So I asked Doug and Matan, <clears throat> why is there a need to promote Zionism in Israel? Well, Doug and Matan were ready for that question and their response was eye-opening. I expect you in the audience are about to learn an awful lot. Matan Peleg is the CEO of Imtir Tzu. He was born and raised in Israel. Matan is married, father of three. He holds a, a bachelor's in political science and Middle Eastern studies from Haifa University and a master's in conflict resolution from Jerusalem's Hebrew University. Matan previously hosted the radio show Radio Zion, which focused on Zionist awareness in Israeli society. In 2014, Matan published his first book, 
between Rishikesh and Tempt the Temple Mount, and his second book in 2016, The Battle for the Zionist Idea. Doug Altebeff is the chairman of the board of directors at Imtir Tzu. A native New Yorker from the Bronx, New York, Doug made Aliyah in 2009 with his wife and their youngest child. He has a degree from Columbia College and a JD from Harvard Law School. After retiring from a professional money management in New York in 2013, Doug has devoted himself to Israel advocacy. He writes extensively in the Jerusalem Post and other English language media. Doug, the program is yours. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it is really a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you in conjunction with the ZOA. Uh, I think I speak for Matan and all of our uh, team when we say we have great uh, respect, we feel a strong kinship to the ZOA, because we see in the ZOA two characteristics that we very, very strongly value about ourselves, and those are clarity and courage. You have the clarity to seek out the truth and the courage to speak the truth. And we, for one, have a great deal of respect for, for you for doing that. And so we're, we're really honored to be with you tonight. Um, before I delve into the topic, um, Alan gave a little bit of a, a taste of who we are, but I think there's probably a fair number of you who might not know who Im Tzu is. It's interesting, we have become something of a household name in Israel, but we're still not that well known here, here, there in the United States. So let me just take a minute to tell you a bit about us. In Tier 2, our name comes, of course, from Theodore Herzl's famous adage, In Tier 2, Zulo Agada. If you will it, In Tier 2, it is no dream. Now, Herzl, of course, was referring to the idea of a Jewish state. When we talk about Im Tirtzu, we are basically saying that the reality of a Jewish state must continue to be willed. In other words, it must be built. It must be nourished, cherished, defended, and protected. Uh, our origins are right after the uh, 2006 Lebanon War. And in fact, the founding of Imtir II is very relevant to our topic tonight. Because what happened was several uh, soldiers returned to their classrooms in universities and were shocked to learn that the army that they had just put, uh, fought with and the country that they had just defended was being accused and labeled by various professors as engaging in war crimes and crimes against humanity. And so in short order, a group came together to try and do something about this, to defend Israel. And that was the beginning. And from a standing start, we have grown to become the largest grassroots Zionist organization in Israel. We now have 20 campuses, campus branches on all of the major campuses and most of the smaller campuses throughout the country. I would say that in any given year, some between six and 8,000 volunteer activists participate in one or another of our activities. Uh, we have the largest social media following in Hebrew of any pro-Israel organization in Israel. And we have a, a large and growing group of friends of Im Tzu, regular Israelis, who have chosen to financially support us. Uh, as Alan alluded to, we have a mission of uh, Sur uh, Osetov and Sur Marad, uh, doing good and distancing from the bad. Uh, we are very well known in Israel for our willingness to confront the bad guys, to confront the, the foreign funding of anti-Zionist organizations, to confront the NIF and and a lot of its toxic activities. And conversely, we, we are extremely involved in the building and nourishing and cherishing aspect of protecting Zionism. Our seminars for Zionist thought, which pre-corona at least, 
were uh, on five of Israel's major campuses on a biweekly basis where free lectures were given by A-list speakers from government, media, culture, academia on topics such as Zionist history, current events, values, and uh, in a program that the Jerusalem Post described as the largest extracurricular academic initiative in Israel. We also do extensive panels throughout the country with very well-known speakers on a variety of important values. We have a very interesting program where we have taken for the last three years Chinese exchange students at Hebrew University and taught them about <clears throat> Israel and taught them Zionism in Mandarin, taking them on tours of Sterot, Hebron, Yerushalayim, all for the purpose of making sure that these people who are not the hard science guys, these are the public affairs students. So they're going to end up in the government. They're going to end up having, playing a role uh, internationally. We want to make sure that they learn about Israel the right way. Uh, we've been very proud of the fact that we've inspired a lot of legislation in our Knesset. And although we are religiously apolitical, we are not tied to any party or movement, we have suggested and inspired legislation protecting the rights of our soldiers and providing for greater transparency in the funding, the foreign funding, the foreign governmental funding of Israeli uh, NGOs. And lastly, we're also very proud of the fact that we have embraced non-Jewish minorities who have chosen to embrace the state of Israel. Every year we sponsor the Zionist Conference for, on Human Rights, where we celebrate, and we extol, and we appreciate the contributions of Bedouins and Christian Arabs and Muslims and Druzim for their efforts on behalf of the state of Israel. There's much more that we've done, but this is just a snapshot. And let, let's start by uh, talking about this situation. You know, Matan and I visit the United States a lot. We have a lot of discussions with supporters, with friends, with, with people who want to learn more about us. And the question comes up quite frequently, what can you do for us here? Sounds like you have everything pretty well nailed down in Israel, not true, but, uh, but we need a lot of help here. What can you do? It's a flattering question, but invariably we answer as follows. We say, you know what, we help you more. We can address anti-Zionism in America, anti-Zionism in the UK more by taking care of business at home. And the reason for that is basically twofold. One has to do with the old adage that used to be applied to Las Vegas, but it applies in reverse to Israel. What happens in Israel doesn't stay in Israel. What happens in Israel instead resonates and reverberates and it echoes throughout the world, not only the Jewish world, but the geopolitical world as well. And so we are very mindful that there is a, an emanation factor, and that's what we're talking about tonight. The other thing that we think is very relevant and, and Alan alluded to this uh, when he said, I was shocked to hear that there is anti-Zionism in Israel. And a lot of people are very surprised to hear that. So surprised to learn that in fact, from our point of view, the global head of the snake, as it were, of BDS is in Israel. And the toxicity of BDS is, is largely a function of toxicity that emanates from Israel itself. Now, if you ask me, why is that? Why would we have uh, this problem? Uh, you know, it's a head shake. But I will want. I want to make one point very clear. the The problems, the lies, and the myths that come from Israel don't come from the air. They don't come from the water supply. They come from Israelis themselves. They come from actual humans, many of whom are academics, many of whom are associated with our preeminent universities. And it is a conundrum. Again, why, the, why would someone choose to demonize 
his own university, to have it uh, uh, boycotted by other sister universities throughout the world? I can't answer that. I'm not a paid psychologist. Uh, and although I've read a lot about uh, Stockholm syndrome and about Galut syndrome and about Jewish self-hatred, it's still a question that's way over my pay grade. But if you ask how are they able to have such an impact, well, that's our conversation. And that we can speak extensively about because they do have an outsized impact for the very simple reason that they are Israeli. Now let's start by, let me pose a hypothetical to you. You are the Latvian delegate to the European Parliament. Latvia does not have a close relationship with Israel. You are likely not to know a great deal about what goes on in Israel. You are sitting in the European Parliament one day, listening to a speaker from Israel, from an organization called Breaking the Silence. And this speaker is testifying to war crimes being committed by the IDF. Crimes of torturing, raping, mutilating innocent Palestinians, particularly Palestinian children. He's not very long on detail, but he's very long on passion. What's your reaction? What's your takeaway from this? I tell you, if I were that delegate, it would be this. Here's a man who's come all the way to Brussels from Israel. He's clearly upset. He lives in Israel. He must know what he's talking about. He's seeing it firsthand. He's wrapping himself in the mantle of human rights. He's seeking to do justice in his society. I better listen to him. I should give him credence. He deserves a very hard and serious hearing. He deserves my credibility. It's all very logical. It's all exactly what is intended. It's all, of course, untrue. It's a fabrication. But I don't know that. I, the delegate, I'm completely unaware of that. What I am picking up on is the fact that an Israeli is speaking about his own society and why would he be coming here if he wasn't telling the truth? And this is the presumption, this, this idea of gaining false credibility, false authenticity, false expertise of presenting yourself as a, an impartial, uh, do-gooder, human rights activist. It's a brilliant business strategy and one that was seized by European governments who realized that by going native, so to speak, by using Europe, uh, Israeli agents in, effectively, Israeli representatives to represent the same foreign policy objectives that they themselves had, but were really not making much headway with the Israeli government, maybe there would be, it would be much more effective to use <clears throat> Israeli intermediaries. So while these organizations and these academics have very, very little popular support in Israel, they enjoy tremendous funding, tremendous financial support from the EU, from the NIF here in the United States, there in the United States, from individual foreign uh, governments in Europe and NGOs connected with those governments. And so it is, it is a real problem. And it's a problem, <coughs> excuse me, that's abetted by the reality that is Israelis who are condemning their own society. I want to, uh, share with you an example of this. Let's, um, we're going to look at a recent, uh, if you can see this, here's an example of uh, oh, a situation that happened at Columbia University last year. A, an Arab professor at Hebrew University comes to Columbia and he claims that Israel is carrying out arms testing on Arab neighborhoods in a lecture that he gives at Columbia. Now, 
Alan pointed out that I'm a native of the Bronx, and in the Bronx, we would call this a good old fashioned blood libel. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. It's an insane fabrication. But guess what? If you're not knowledgeable about Israel, you don't know this. You don't know this. What you see is a Hebrew University professor standing in a Columbia University lecture hall wrapped with the mantle of authenticity of academia and presenting a claim that seems unimpeachable on its face because why would he say it if it weren't true, right? And that's what we're dealing with. And there is an upshot to it. A few months later, the Columbia College Student Council passes a ballot initiative to hold an anti-Israel divestment referendum. Okay, it really doesn't matter whether the referendum passes or not. What matters is that the well has been poisoned. What matters is that, the, that a narrative of warpage has been introduced, that toxicity has been introduced about Israel, what it stands for, and what its values are. And that seepage coming from a Hebrew University professor does enormous, enormous amount of damage. Here is another uh, example. Um, we have Hen Mazi, who is a gay activist. He is a, uh, an IDF veteran. He speaks a lot about the IDF and how humane an institution it is, how kind it has been to gays, how kind it has been in its dealings with, with our enemies, frankly. And he was speaking at Vassar College last year. He's booed off the stage. All right. This happens in the United States now, unfortunately. A lot of people get booed off the stage. Why is Penn booed off the stage? Well, the next day, the, the campus director of the Students for Justice for Palestine chapter writes in the Vassar uh, newspaper a, uh, an explanation for why. Well, it turns out, you know, Penn was serving in a military that has killed thousands of Palestinians, imprisoning, harassing, demolishing their homes, cutting off resources, and murdering innocent ones. And his corroboration, his proof texts are from Israeli organizations, Beth Salem, Breaking the Silence, the Association for Human Rights, uh, Physicians for Human Rights, uh, Rabbis for Human Rights, he is using information coming from Israel to build a bogus, a false narrative, but a very powerful one. And again, we live in a world now where facts don't really matter. And even if you knew the facts here, it might not have mattered. But, but most people don't know the facts. They're very happy to accept what uh, he is saying at at face value. In this slide, you can see here's a collage of, uh, we could fill the rest of the evening with a collage of articles where Israeli academics uh, call for the boycotting of their own institution, call for foreign governments to pass legislation uh, boycotting businesses in Judea and Samaria or in East Jerusalem. <clears throat> uh, and Again, the, their credibility is greatly enhanced because they come from Israel itself. Now, what we want to do now is talk about what we in particular are trying to do about it. What we find is that our efforts are centered in two areas of trying to fight this kind of delegitimization. It's centered on campus activities and it's centered on what we would call on the ground activities. The common thread between the two areas is that most, much of it is propagated by anti-Israeli NGOs, which as I mentioned a few minutes ago, have very little popular support, but immense financial support coming from uh, European government financing. In fact, just today, the foreign minister of Germany is in Israel 
meets with Netanyahu, and the headline in Arut Sheva is the first thing that Netanyahu said to him is stop funding anti-Israel NGOs here. You've got to stop it. It's toxic, it's poisonous, and it is, it is very, very harmful. So this is not something we're making up. The prime minister was well aware of it and called out the foreign minister of Germany for it. So this idea of these organizations, individual academics, many of these academics are directors of these organizations, advisors to them. They're very, very well endowed. They have plenty of money to fly around the world. By the way, if you're an academic whose career is lagging in, the, in Israel, you go to the United States, you start bashing Israel. And guess what happens? You get invited to appear at a conference. You get invited to write an article for a journal. Your career takes a major, major uh, step up. It's a big boost. It's good business for you to bash Israel. What I want to do now is ask my colleague, my pal, Matan Peleg, to talk about what we in Tier 2 are doing, and in many cases, uniquely successfully doing, to try and stop this flow of lies and myths coming out of our country. Matan? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Doug. Um, something it was important for me to say is that um, at the beginning we didn't notice, but uh, with the time we understood that we are talking about a phenomena that is not authentic. It's not, it's not really comes from the ground, from the Israeli public. And what do I mean? In every society you will meet, uh, you know, people that have lunatic thoughts, okay? There are people who believe in aliens and people who believe that the world is flat and there are people who believe that uh, we are doing war crimes. We saw that the European governments find ra very radical people who believe and uh, blame Israel uh, that we are doing war crimes, that we are doing uh, crimes against humanity, and they give a lot of money to those NGOs, to those people. And we are seeing with the time that a very small minority in Israel starting to have a lot of uh, power, because money is power. And um, so the people who want to blame Israel uh, in those things, people who, is, who are against Israel as Jewish and a democratic state, they have um, um, accessibility to um, European Union and to the United Nations and to the foreign governments. And the money invested in two ways, in the NGOs, as I said, and in the academia. One of the things that we did when we understood it is uh, we started to promote, first of all, the idea of the need. And later on, it became a law and we, we called it the transparency law. We uh, showed, do, do we unmask those organizations, we, sh we showed that all those radicals have, all their money comes from outside, all their power is coming from outside. For example, in Tirzu, for example, we, to be effective and to be so big and to be so strong, we have to have the Israeli society uh, beh behind us. But here you have more than 50 radical NGOs that are against Israel completely, and they don't care if the Israelis uh, love them or not because they are drink their power from outside, from foreign governments. They need their legitimacy from other countries. And they promote this propaganda in Israel, but from uh, the wind that is uh, uh, backing them is from outside. And a lot of professors, as, as Doug said, lots of professors uh, um, with the time saw that if they, become, if they uh, blame Israel on lunatic stuff, if they uh, go around the world, Ireland, uh, Columbia University, no matter where, and they start to blame Israel in war crimes, 
and start to bash Israel, they get more money. They benefit out of the conflict. It's a business. To hate Israel, as an Israeli, it's a business. The money uh, is buying, buying law clinics in Israel, because in Israel, for example, if you are a, an NGO and you have, you have enough money, you can buy you, um, a, a practicum, law clinic, and you can make courses in the academia. So they are like this. The, the more and more students also that like, and you will all, and you will always find people who hate something. So you can today volunteer in B'Tselem and break the silence of very radical organizations in Israeli academia and get credit points. And the professors who are like really hate Israel, they're going around the world and bash Israel. And also we saw that head, heads of NGOs who are professors in the Israeli academia, they're also going, this is what we called a on the ground a activity, on the ground BDS in Israel. We are seeing that those professors together with those students are going to harass Israeli soldiers in Gaza Strip, in Judea and Samaria, uh, in the Golan Heights, and it became, a, became a, like a tourism, a BDS tourism. People are coming with cameras to harass our soldiers. And we are seeing always the linkage. It's foreign governmental money who goes to NGOs and goes to Israeli academia. And if you, are, if you hate Israel, you can really uh, benefit out of it. So the thing is that we are doing, so we started all, the, all this journey that we started in Israel as Im Tirzu, was first of all to open this uh, Pandora box, to show it to, to the Israeli society. After that, we explained people, because if you will ask, and every Israeli, uh, every, uh, average Israeli, and you will ask him, do you, do you have a problem with the BDS movement? Most of them will say no. Because the, it, in the in United States and in Israel, it, it looks different. But from the other side, so we showed, so all the universities in Israel, for example, boycott uh, the Ariel University that is in uh, Judea, in, uh, Judea in, the, in the Shomron, sorry. And um, so we showed, look, this is BDS from within. And by the way, the first movement who promoted the BDS against Ariel University is a movement in the name of a boycott from within. It's a, it's a move, it's a group of Israeli professors who work with Electronic Intifada, that is also a, a BDS, a very radical group, a American group. So they, they promote BDS, they promote an anti-Israeli approach very strongly in Israel. And those radicals um, have a lot of impact in the Israeli academia, a lot of impact in Israeli courts, because they have money, so they go to court a lot against a lot of things, um, against soldiers, against a lot of laws that we are trying to promote. So this phenomena is everywhere, and what Intertsu is doing is um, expose it, and also connecting the dots, showing uh, what is going on. Uh, just for a last example, I'll, I, we are always, we are showing it in a, like a, and by the way, later on I will send it, a, we will send it to all of the people that are uh, now in this uh, Zoom. We, in the, this is Israeli map, we have Israeli map, and um, we are showing that every, every point, every point in Israel is under attack. The BDS movement, the, the international BDS movement, is trying to convince the world that Israel doesn't have a right to exist. This is something that you cannot do to Israelis within, inside Israel. But what you can do is taking every point in Israeli map and do delegitimize, about, to delegitimize it and to boycott it. You can say that we are doing ethnic cleansing to the Bedouins in the Negev, that we are doing war crimes in Gaza, that we are doing apartheid in Judea and Samaria, that we are occupied the Golan Heights, that we are occupied the Jordan Valley, that we are racist to um, asylum seekers uh, uh, that comes from Africa, 
and to Israel. So they blame Israel in every point of Israel is under attack. We are seeing it, uh, and then the, this is what they are teaching the Israeli academia, and you can get credit points if you're taking those courses. You can volunteer in those NGOs, can make good money, good salaries. And also, when you, we are going a lot to the Knesset, to the Israeli parliament, and talking with our politicians, they say, look, we have to deal with it. A lot of time, we are, um, the answers that, that we get is like, look, it is very complicated to promote those laws against those phenomena because European governments are involved. And at the end of the day, Israel is a small country that needs good relationship with the European governments. So even in the Knesset, people are afraid to uh, handle with those uh, uh, phenomena, those situ situations. So Im Tirzu has a very large a movement. Is what we are doing is like, we are taking the public, we are taking and, and um, the public, we create a public discourse and showing the people, showing the decision makers how important it is to the future of Israel, and we force them uh, to do something about it. As Doug said, today the Prime Minister talked about uh, the, foreign, uh, the German uh, foreign minister. So this is all, today we also, we made a, a very big demonstration in the morning when he came, why? Because last week in Saturday, uh, in Shabbat, uh, it was a very big demonstration uh, against uh, the sovereignty uh, in uh, the Jordan Valley, the annexation, as they say, and it was a v and everybody were with the uh, PLO Palestinian flags, and it was in the middle of Tel Aviv. But we showed that all the organizations who led who led this demonstration got money from the German government. And then the, suddenly the, the minister is from Germany came. So we are showing that it's like a game. The German government used their soldiers, soldiers, yes, in Israel, those NGOs that it fund to change the Israeli public opinion, to create a public opinion before the minister is coming and then he come. So it is very important that we are sh showing it. The Americans, they don't understand it. You all, I, I, I was amazed when the America almost went back to the Cold War because you blame the American blame uh, the Americans blame uh, the Russians for posting some uh, fund some posts on Facebook to try to um, change the public opinion before the election. This is nothing in Israel. They're like they are going to court. They are influence. Uh, they are doing campaigns, doing lobbying in the Knesset, doing lobbying in the world institutions. So it's a very strong war and it's very hard, but uh, as I'm seeing the support and I think the, um, the love that we get from uh, the Israeli public, I understand every day that uh, <clears throat> how crucial is what we are doing and how it's uh, needed. Matan, I, I, um, I think our, our uh, participants would be interested to see one of the things, and you mentioned that we do things on the ground, it is astounding. Uh, what, what, we're going to show you a couple of films now that you will not believe, you will think are staged because the protocol of the IDF is basically not to protect soldiers from harassment by people who want to film them for the purpose of hoping to catch them doing some unspeakable act. Uh, that they can upload onto social media and, and of course, uh, to uh, defame and demonize uh, Israel. So what I'm going to share with you are um, two interesting films. The first one is taken in Hebron and it is, uh, If you can see, here we go. Oh, let's try it again. Uh, 
I don't hear the sound. Do you hear the sound? Doug, this is Alan. We're not hearing sound. Uh, yeah, we can explain uh, what is going on there. Okay, so what we are seeing here in the photo, that in, the, in the video that we don't hear, is we are seeing a group of tourists who come with their cameras and go to uh, the Israeli soldiers in Hebron. Okay, this is what I told, this is like what I told you about BDS tourism. Okay, foreigners, uh, tourists, together with Israeli anti-Zionist, very far left activists, come together to places in Hebron and Judea and Samaria, and with their cameras, put their cameras like this in front of the, of the people, of the soldiers, and harassing them. And like this, they enjoy, because of the Israeli soldiers, of course, will not do anything to them. And, uh, and this is a, a very uh, problematic phenomenon. Um, by Were the you way, hearing, did, did you hear the, uh, the, the voiceover or just see the image? No, we couldn't hear, but Matan was, Matan was narrating. Okay, okay. Um, so it's amazing that you, here you have soldiers, and this was in Hebron, as Matan probably indicated, a uh, very sensitive area, and people feel no compunction about sticking a camera in the face of a soldier. And, and, and of course, they're hoping to get a reaction and they're hoping to capture that reaction and then upload it uh, onto social media. And, and again, this is, this is classic spreading the, the good news, as it were, uh, from Israel to the rest of the world. It's, it's very, very insidious. And we started an initiative called Filming the Filmers, where we send uh, you, the, the, the fellow who was talking there uh, is Tom Nisani, one of our team members, uh, who is there to confront the people who are confronting our soldiers. And we've done a very effective job. Matan, you can you speak better than I can about uh, how effective we've been in chasing away some of these uh, these anarchists that, that are harassing our soldiers. Oh, okay, so what was, uh, as Doug said in the beginning, Im Tirzu, our like um, a strategic approach is, uh, is doing positive stuff, uh, do good and uh, fight the bad, fight the negative and so uh, mira. And as we, we are doing two things. We are fighting the, all the challenges that I talked and Doug talked before, but we also, it, was, it is very important for us to teach and provide knowledge to the Israelis, okay? To teach the students, because intuitive Zionism is not enough. It's not enough to just love your country. People in Israel, they need to have an inner belief, an inner understanding that Israel is not something to take for granted. The propaganda, against Israel outside and inside Israel is very strong and it's important that people will, uh, will be connected to the Zionist uh, idea and goal. So we are doing a lot of lectures, as Doug said, but we're also doing a project of tours, taking people to Hebron, taking people to Jerusalem. And week after week, month after month, when we took our students and our people and general students to Hebron, we, are so, we saw again and again those groups, anti-Israeli group, very far left groups, foreigners and Israelis, radicals, who go and arrest those soldiers. So we decided to fight fire with fire. We said, look, it's not enough to take the students and to teach them about Hebron and to connect them to, to the Jewish land and history. Let's also do the same every time we, uh, we will uh, see those anarchists who go and harass the soldiers with cameras like this, we will suggest our students also to go and film those anarchists. And those BDS people, when they are seeing that we are starting to um, um, picture them, 
and upload it later to our Facebook page, they got very scared. It was too much for them. Um, so the soldiers, they don't know what to do against those anarchists. So we created a, a fight fire with fire a tactic to, and like this, uh, we are taking those anarchists out. By the way, we also created with the former uh, minister Gilad Erdan, also with the time, uh, like a blacklist of BDS leaders who come to Israel with groups, like they're like tourist groups, tourist uh, guides, who come to Israel with those people just to harass soldiers. And when we, mm -hmm. we gave it to the government, they tried to stop them from coming to Israel. It's really hooligans who come just to annoy. Matan, this is Alan. I'm going to jump in because I want to give people a chance to ask you guys questions, sure. and there are a lot of great questions stacked up. I'm going to take the liberty to ask the first question because it's something that I've actually been thinking about. <clears throat> uh, the ZOA and MTR2 both concentrate on students on college campuses. But, you, but the demographic of college students in the United States and in Israel is a little bit different. Your, your college student has already, by and large, been through the IDF and maturity and, and defended Israel, sometimes facing bullets. So why is it that Imtir Tzu still finds that students who have done this and made that commitment are being seduced or potentially seduced and affected by the forces of BDS? Well, I, I thought that I, uh, I, I tried to address this question in the beginning. It's always hard to answer it, but um, in my opinion, again, you will always find radicals who think lunatic stuff on any, any issue, but um, on this particular issue, when you will always find people who hated the army uh, or the service in the IDF was too complicated emotionally for them. But, and then they create a career of, uh, you know, taking those emotions on steroids and start to blame Israel as a business. Right. Like breaking the silence and stuff. So right. you will always find those people. You'll always find them. You know, Alan, I think that there is a significant difference. Um, and as Martin said, it's, it's not an all or nothing thing. There are going to be... Uh, uh, people who, uh, for whatever reason, are, are radical. But, but thankfully, in Israel, the vast majority of the students do not buy into this. And, and that is why we enjoy the kind of following that we enjoy on campuses, precisely because a lot of students are looking for an address to express their love of country, are looking for an address to push back against um, demonstrations demonizing Israel. I don't think it's the same that you have in the United States. What's, what's common between the two countries on campus is the toxicity of a lot of the faculty. But the student body in Israel, I think, is much more, has its head screwed on much straighter. Okay, great. One of our national board members, Len Guest, asked a very interesting question. How does the Israeli education system, grades 1 through 12, teach Zionism and the history of Israel? You want to take it or me, Doug? No, you, you my friend. So I think the, um, the educational system in Israel is not the best, and there is a, it deserves a lot of criticize. Uh, in my opinion, I talked about it with my father a lot, and he said when... The, when Look, Israel is only 70 years old. So the generation who created and built the educational system in Israel, those people, it was obvious for them why Israel need to be exist. So they didn't invest a lot of time in create lessons uh, that will teach the kids why um, Zionism is so important and they, so they should teach Balfour, on, on the Balfour Declaration, for example, only like a history lesson, historic, historic event, not something that have a lot of meaning to the Jewish people. All the uh, deep, uh, and, uh, deep values of Zionism, the deep uh, ideas are not uh, teaching in, in school. 
So only in the last uh, grade, before they're going to army, a lot of, people, a lot of kids, they send them to Poland to see the, um, uh, you know, all, all the, the ghettos and the Holocaust uh, places. And like this, like this, they say, okay, so we need Israel because if not, Israel will not be exist. Uh, the Germans will come. So, okay. But this is not a good education. It's just create people who are ignorant Mm. And um, so uh, it, it's very problematic. It's very problematic. It is, We, it is problematic. Yeah. But the one thing I think that, they, that Israel does well, look, half this country has ADD. You know, kids can't sit very long in their seats. And so what we do a good job of here is taking kids around the country. We take them on tours and they see their history. They see biblical history. They see Israeli history. And you know what, you do connect. Uh, you may not get it out of a book, but when you see uh, the place where there was a pitched battle in 48, you see in Ammunition Hill in 67, these things sink in, they do resonate. And we, we need to do a lot better job of, uh, our, uh, of educating uh, our students. And like what Matan was saying, what his dad was pointing out was we didn't think Doug, you're on mute. Doug, you've been muted. All right, well, my time until he figures it out, let me ask you another question. Oh, Doug's back. I'm Doug, I'm going to ask him, you went on mute. Okay, I was just saying that we do a good job taking kids around the country right. and, and exposing them to uh, the places here. I'm going to roll. Yep. Go ahead. No, no, I want to roll two questions into one. Uh, does the Israeli government uh, fund enough for public relations? And can the Israeli government do anything to stop the self-hating Israeli NGOs, especially for spreading false facts? What do you think, Patan? Uh, yes. Look, um, I think the, basically the Israeli government need to do much more than it, 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 it does. And uh, a lot of uh, laws that they were promoted, a lot of us that are in Israel, some of them, we, are, we were very involved in uh, doing them for like the boycott law. There is a law in Israel that you cannot do boycott, do boycott any place in Judea and Samaria. But still, there are institutions, even like academic institutions who boycott, uh, like the Ariel University that I said, and other businesses in Judea and Samaria. So there are a lot of laws that are, but no one is doing, force them. Um, what we're doing in Imtertsu, by the way, we, this is the only reason that we created also a, a, a legal division that we are going with lawyers. We threaten a lot uh, to sue play, people that uh, boycott uh, Israel from within. And we bring a lot of results like this. We force, we are like, we are doing it instead of the, of, uh, the government. So the government need, can do a lot. And it, most of the time, it's very hard for them to, to force the law, to do it. And again, maybe it's because of the, what they said before, but because of the foreign government's involvement. Um, so sometimes we are forcing it in, in different ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liz Bernie, uh, ZOA Director of Special Projects, has a question. Liz, I'm unmuting you. Okay, I also put it in the chat, but I was wondering if you publicize the names of the persons involved in this BDS harassment tourism, because this information would be very helpful to us. Uh, last fall, ZOA uh, passed and managed to pass through the World Zionist Congress a resolution to throw BDS promoters out of the World Zionist Congress. But if we don't know who they are, we won't be able to um, to, to, to do that effectively. And, you know, I'm wondering if you either publicize that or can at least, you know, provide the information to us so that we can, you know, stop the sort of attempts to take over the World Zionist Congress and, and turn, it, oh, turn it against Israel, which is something that ZOA has been very, very focused on, on right. including stopping the infiltration efforts by groups like Moxa Watch, you know, these anti-Israel NGOs, which, uh, you know, like ours has been trying, the reform group is has been trying to bring into the Congress? So this is a good uh, question. I, I will start it with the academia, with the short story. We, when we saw that there are dozens of uh, 
Israeli professors who are going around the world and just bash Israel for money, we created a, a website and we call it uh, Know Your Professor. It's in Hebrew. And inside you have like a list and list and list of people and what are the radical anti-Israeli activities. Every professor that is doing promote BDS or stuff like this is coming to our uh, website. And um, uh, it was funny when it was, we got a lot of a fire in the media about it. The professors <clears throat> said it's a witch hunt. So we said, why? You are going around the world and uh, promote BDS and we are doing you a favor and publish it in Israel. Why you don't want the Israelis to know about it? <laughs> Great. After, after, after time, uh, people overseas came to us and said, look, you have to also translate this website to English because there are lots of Israel professors and we, know to, we want to know about it. So very soon we will have this website in English about what you said. Also, we have a similar website in Hebrew in Israel. And now slowly, slowly, where we will upload it to a very professional website. And then we will also um, translate it to English. The people of our brothers and sisters, for example, in the ZOA, will, will know who are those people that are uh, doing those damages. And uh, I hope it will also help you with your uh, challenge. Great. So I'm going to ask one more question and then uh, Doug or Matan, if you'd like to make some closing remarks. Doug, this one might actually speak to you. It's from our regional director in Philadelphia, Steve Feldman, who uh, is, has a history in journalism. And his question is, the Israeli media is particularly bad. Explain the Israeli media mindset and how a lack of a First Amendment matters. Well, um, when he says it's bad, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he means. I, I would, in, intuitively, I would tend to agree with him. I mean, I think the, the media in, in Israel is somewhat like the media in uh, uh, the United States. It's very, very, it skews very left. With, with a couple of exceptions um, and uh, has a cottage industry of bashing prime minister and certain other uh, prominent uh, right-wing uh, politicians. There is, um, there is not a formal first amendment in Israel because there is not a written constitution, but there is very much the idea of free speech is a is a very uh, is taken extremely seriously. Uh, of course, it sometimes is a one way street. You know, it's it's uh, freedom of speech for me, but not for thee, uh, and depends on what the speech is. So that can be very exasperating. There there are definitely double standards that the press participates in, uh, and uh, you know, look, we. We have a, we actually have a scrapbook of quotes from Haaretz about us. And if you read these things, you would blush. You know, we, we, you think we're running the country. I mean, they have us pulling the strings. We're controlling the government. I said to my wife one day, if we're running the country, how come we have to stand online like jerks, like everyone else in, at the bank and the post office? But, um, you know, so we, we are... Uh, the, the press is very happy to be highly, highly opinionated. And uh, yes, but it's all about free speech. That's great. Would you like to make some closing remarks, Doug? Before what I close I'd the like to do is just um, put on the uh, screen our website in English great. for anyone who would like to get more information about us. Uh, there it is, mt.org.il slash en. Um, we're very, very happy to um, uh, have you learn more about what we are doing. Also, I had mentioned to uh, Alan, and maybe you do this, uh, I don't know how you want to do this, Alan, but I'd be very happy to uh, have uh, anyone send questions to me to my personal website, my Gmail um uh, I'm sorry, my Gmail email address and and uh, answer questions after the fact. And Alan, you can distribute that uh, as you see. Be, hey, Doug, I'll, I'll, when I'm closing, why don't you type your email address into the chat area? And uh, then people. Okay. 
and then people can have your email address. Okay, well, you're, giving, you're giving me a lot of credit, Alan. Oh, my time will do it for you. Here it is. Yeah, I see it, and uh, I'll do that right now. But uh, we, we are uh, very happy to have uh, inquiries, and uh, by all means, reach out to either of us. And again, we're very uh, uh, thrilled to be doing this with the ZOA. We hope we have more opportunities to intersect with uh, ZOA uh, supporters going forward. And uh, the, uh, I, I hope this was helpful for you. I hope it was eye-opening to see the reality that uh, there is so much coming out of Israel that needs to be addressed on a 24-7 basis. I'm very proud of, of Imtir 2. We're a small organization, but we do, we hit way, way, way above our weight in terms of the number of people that we have in our office, our financial resources. Uh, uh, I think we are a vital resource. I, I said at one of our conferences that if Imtir, Imtir 2 did not exist, the state of Israel would have to invent it because of the, the role that we play. So I want to thank all of you tonight for joining us. Matan, you are a pal for staying up with me at two in the morning to do this. <laughs> and well, uh, from the office, and, no and drive and safely that, home. And that doesn't go unnoticed by us. Thank you both so much for being with us up and about. Before I actually do my close, I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Natalie Lazaroff, who never gets any of the limelight, but does all of the hard work for our webinars in the background. Thank you, Natalie. Hey, Doug and Matan, one thing that didn't come up, <clears throat> uh, you know, ZOA runs missions to uh, Israel, uh, both uh, national missions for our core membership and our student missions. And when our students go to Israel, uh, they're exposed to true Israel advocacy. They cross the Green Line. We visit Judea and Samaria. And it's absolutely no surprise to any of us <clears throat> that part of the um, part of their trip, it's become a tradition that in Tier 2 fellows meet our own students. They get together and they talk about the challenges. They compare the different challenges that they face and that uh, we are facing here in the United States, BDS being the most common theme. Uh, our work in Tier 2 and ZOA is so similar, se separated but in, by an ocean, uh, but connected to our shared heritage and our love for our homeland. May you continue to go from strength to strength, and let us continue to find ways to cooperate and make each other stronger. For those in the audience, these are very tough times indeed. Now more than ever, we need your support. We enjoyed success at the WZC elections, but we now face challenges at the Conference of Presidents, and we will continue to advocate for Israel's right to exercise sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. All of this costs money, so please help us by going to www.zoa.org, click the red donate button, and give generously. Upcoming program, tomorrow at 1 p.m., our ZOA book club, hosted by ZOA Director of Special Projects, Liz Bernie, is hosting author Josh London. The book title is Victory in Tripoli. It's a great piece of history. You'll really learn an awful lot. On Tuesday, June 16th at 7 p.m., uh, ZOA Philadelphia Executive Director Steve Feldman will be interviewing Charles Jacobs of Americans for Peace and Tolerance. Those of you who were on one of our book clubs where Charles was one of the speakers know that you will be in for quite an information treat. And on Wednesday, we don't yet have the book title, sorry, but we do have a ZOA book club uh, posted for 1 p.m., Watch our, um, watch our uh, emails and follow us on social media. This concludes today's program. Everybody be safe and be healthy. Thank you again to our guests from Israel, especially for staying up. And uh, I hope we find many, many ways to cooperate. Everybody have a nice evening.